Larry, if you could please mute yourself. So I'm really excited to welcome Jennifer um, Renwick to Westbridge. Um, I uh, met her, but didn't meet her online at the Out of Chicago um, workshops that they had, a three-day workshop last year during the shutdown. And I was so impressed. I wrote to her and said, can you please come and talk to our camera club? And she said, yeah, sure, of course I will. So. Anyways, um, I wrote her bio on all of the emails that I sent out. I also put it in the chat here. She's based in Colorado. She um, travels around with her partner, David Kingham, teaching photo workshops. I am signed up for their workshop in December at Death Valley. So I'm really excited about that because I've never been there. Um, Jennifer's passion is focusing on the smaller details in landscapes um, and also slow photography. She and David uh, founded the um, Nature Photographers Network, which I joined. It's a great forum to post your photos and get critiques if you want or not. Um, you don't have to have critiques, but you get professional thoughts. And um, they're also founders of quite a few other organizations, which you can see in the chat. So I will turn it over to Jennifer. Please mute yourself and have a good time, everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Roberta, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here to talk to you guys tonight about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So just give me a second here. Let me organize my screen and make sure everything works. Okay, can you just tell me, Roberta, do you just yes. see the slide? Yeah. Okay, good. oops. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. And just one little note, if anyone has questions, I'm actually gonna, here, let me move the chat over so I can see it without advancing my thing. Um, feel free, I'm gonna have the chat up. I might miss some questions. Um, if it's something pertinent to what was just on a slide or a photo, that I just showed, you know, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, that's fine. If it's more of a general question, then we can save that for the end. Um, so my presentation, depending on how fast I talk and how many questions there are, usually it's it runs about an hour 10, hour 15. So hopefully I don't lose anybody. Um, I try to make it as engaging as I can. Um, hopefully I keep your guys' attention. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you guys for joining me, joining me today. This is taking the slow approach, using slow photography for more impactful and compelling nature photography. And let me just do one more thing, get this window closed. Because all the things that academics have to do. Hang on one second. Okay, never mind. Okay. So thank you for joining me today. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's helped me create more fulfilling imagery and it's enhanced my vision for my own photography. Um, so I'm going to share today some techniques on how to utilize slow photography in the field, how to capture the stories and the landscapes that we photograph, and how to insert your own feelings into your imagery to connect with viewers. So a little background on me. Um, I'm originally from Illinois. Um, I have a background in geology and veterinary medicine. I I was a hobby photographer for about three years, and now I've been doing it full time for professionally for about five. Um, after a life change, I took a break from my job in Illinois, um, left the veterinary clinic that I was working at. I met my partner, David, who is also a professional nature photographer, and we hit the road full time um, to pursue photography and to teach. So we currently travel full time in a four season travel trailer. And you can see that here on the screen. Um, we've been doing it for four or five years this May. We have not killed each other. It's been a feat. Um, we still enjoy it immensely. Um, we also travel with our two cats there. You can see my two little fur balls there. And for cats, they actually take to traveling quite, quite well. Um, they're almost like dogs. So I think that kind of helps. They're not your typical cat. Um, so they're, they enhance our lives on the road and they're really fun. Um, so living on the road has really allowed us to connect and get to know places intimately. So we then share that on with our students on our workshops. 
and it's just it's been a real experience um, the last five years and we do have a home base in golden colorado so we do come home to a house that we share with my father about two to three times a year um, but for the most part we're fully on the road full time so together david and i are exploring exposure we teach landscape photography workshops throughout the west and provide educational resources like ebooks tutorials and articles as roberta said we are also the co-owners of the nature photographers network um, david took over it about two years ago and kind of revived it it's been around since 2002 um, but it's a great place for education photo critiques that go beyond, you know, great photo. And, you know, we, we don't allow any negativity on there, no drama, no politics. Um, it's quite a reprieve from social media. So if you're tired of social media um, and you want to engage with other like-minded photographers, um, I encourage you to check out the Nature Photographers Network. We are also co-founders of the Nature First Photography Movement along with seven other Colorado nature photographers. So Nature First is dedicated to how we can be good stewards to the land that we love and photograph. Um, we came up with seven principles to follow or to keep in mind um, when out shooting to help us protect these places that we love and photograph so much and how we can educate others to do the same. So just a few objectives for today. So I'm going to touch on what slow photography is and present some techniques that you can incorporate into your own photography. Um, I'll go over some techniques that I have found useful on my journey um, that have really helped me connect and interact with the landscapes that I shoot. Um, I'll kind of go over how I like to tell stories in the landscape for more engaging photography. And then I'm going to dive into another topic near and dear to my heart, which is curating photo projects. So I'm covering two topics today, and these two topics have a lot of moving pieces to discuss. Um, I'm not diving too deep into composition, even though I'm touching on it a little bit in my storytelling segment, um, along with just a little brief discussion on colors. They're both very important topics, but the focus is the slow approach today. And the info that I'm presenting is based on my observations and things that I've learned throughout my journey. The examples that I use, the concepts that I talk about are not the end all be all. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'm sharing my experiences and distilling them down into pieces that hopefully you can kind of grab and take back out in the field to help you right now. I enjoy sharing my journey and we all have our own journeys. That's what makes this craft so fulfilling and exciting. And that's how we learn from each other. So you'll see some reoccurring themes with my topics. Um, some of those themes are photographing what you're passionate about, um, you know, using feelings in your imagery and just being a happy photographer. So just a little intro on my photographic style. Um, I focus mainly on the smaller scenes and details in nature. Having a background in geology and veterinary medicine has made me very perceptive and I use observing a lot in my photography work. Um, and that comes from my background in these two fields. So animals can't talk to you and the earth can't tell you how it formed. So both fields rely heavily on observations. And that's a key component as to how I interact with nature. I find and photograph the smaller details within the landscape. Um, I enjoy black and white, natural abstracts. I still occasionally like the Grand Scenic. Um, so you'll see a lot of imagery from Death Valley National Park and Yellowstone National Park. Um, not only are those two my favorite places to photograph, but they're also where we spend a lot of our time. So you'll see a lot of imagery from there. So what is slow photography? So slow photography or the slow movement as it's referred to advocates a cultural shift in slowing down life's pace. So it all started in 1986 in Rome um, when a protest broke out in McDonald's <laughs> as it was being built, which is kind of funny when you think about it. Um, people around the area were very upset at the idea of fast food. So, you know, if anyone that knows the Italian culture knows that they relish, you know, home cooked meals and a slower way of life with those meals. Um, and you know, those ideals are very important. So they didn't enjoy the idea of fast food um, as you know, food is something that's supposed to be savored and not rushed. And over time, the slow movement concept evolved into other subcultures, um, including food, cities, um, education, fashioning, gardening, just to name a few, and of course the visual arts, including photography. So it's about quality over quantity with the slow approach. Um, nature is already a therapeutic me medium for most of us. So this approach takes us a bit deeper into our imagery and encourages a more deliberate and personal connection with nature. 
So slow photography is about taking time to see what all is there around us. Nature is full of moments and stories waiting to be captured with our lenses. Slow photography is about photographing the ordinary and seeing the extraordinary. It's about taking time to notice those details and appreciating them. And this is some mud in Death Valley. Um, it just reminded me of ice that you'd see almost kind of in an ice cave. It was still wet. So it picked up the nice little subtle glow and um, highlights from the twilight that I was shooting in. And slow photography is about photographing what is personal and meaningful to you. Um, not photographing for the masses or for what's popular. It's about giving yourself permission to play and experiment with your camera and your vision. And finally, it's about, actually not finally, just kidding. It's about connecting and listening to the landscape around you, taking in the sights, the sounds, and the light to guide your photographic vision. And finally, slow photography is about being present and taking in your surroundings, no matter what kind of conditions nature decides to give you that day. So we live in a world of instantaneous gratification with all the technology we're surrounded by. This quote by Joe McNally, technology has eliminated the basement darkroom and the whole notion of photography as an intense labor of love for obsessives and replace them with a sense of immediacy and instant gratification. So even though he's talking more about the dark room, this does apply to us today. Amazon, Netflix, digital photography, even the way we order our food with DoorDash are all great examples of this. We've replaced the dark room with computers and we instantly see our images on the back of our LCDs. So while this quote refers to more the technical side, we can still appreciate this mindset when we're out in the field. We tend to rush out, grab the shot, and then head home. So why slow down? Slowing down when out photographing allows us to become more intimate with our natural subjects in the landscape. It allows you to connect, be present, and it opens up your mind and empowers you to be more creative. It allows you to be curious about the world. We're visual creatures by nature, and the more curious you are about the landscapes around you, the more you start to see the nuances that make up those landscapes. I know those people have briefca briefcases. If you can just imagine tripods and cameras. I mean, we, all, we see this all the time when we're out in the field and David and I have even been one of those individuals running out to the sunset. There's no shame. Um, so just another disclaimer, I, there is no shame. You know, you, you, if you like chasing weather and sunsets, then that's awesome. You know, more power to you. Um, I generally don't. So that's just why I focus more on smaller intimate scenes, but please do not take this as, you know, that's bad photography. No, it's still fun to chase light and weather. Believe me, it's just kind of instinct to us photographers, especially. So sunrises and sunsets happen quickly. We rush out into the field, we see these epic shots and we can get tunnel vision. We're so focused on the big picture, we can miss moments. So I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've seen those mad dashes from those photographers, including myself, especially for this image. So while there's nothing wrong with chasing these images or chasing the light, you know, David and I still like a good sunset, a nice slow burner, um, interesting weather or storms, Taking the time to slow down helps exercise your creativity and work different parts of your brain, making you a more well-rounded photographer. I understand you need to be quick to catch these moments and there's nothing wrong with that. But approaching these scenes with more of an open mind than just sunrise, sunset is what slow photography is about. For instance, not only would I like to come back with an image like this, but I'd also like to know what was happening before this image. Did the light interact with the landscape after the rain? What happened after the rain? Maybe there was a rainbow? Maybe there were some neat water droplets on the flowers on those bushes that you see in the foreground. I can tell you this photograph was taken when I was not a slow photographer. I remember pulling over, yelling at David, like, oh my gosh, pull over. So we screeched off the road into a pullout. We grabbed this shot. We were trying to avoid getting stuck by struck by lightning. It was pretty intense. And then we got back in the car and we drove away. So we've all been there, no shame, no judgment. There is no right or wrong way to photograph scenes like this, but by sharing some ideas with you today, I just hope it'll inspire you to slow down. So how do we slow down? So I'm gonna go through a few of the techniques that'll help you become more connected. 
Um, so some of these are practicing contemplative photography, eliminating expectations, a tough one for us, experimenting, trying something new, getting out and just connecting with nature, <clears throat> excuse me, photographing what you're passionate about, and telling a story and using your own emotions. So contemplative photography. So this is quite an in-depth subject, um, but I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Um, John Barclay, um, he talks a lot about this. Um, he did a webinar with um, my partner, David Kingham on this. David Johnston's talked about this. Um, so I encourage you to explore their webinars and presentations for a little bit deeper dive. But essentially contemplative photography is being open to seeing the details around you. You're focusing on the shapes, the textures, the lights and the colors, and you're using your senses to guide your eye and your curiosity. Contemplative photography is about turning off the day-to-day -day thoughts and focusing on being present in the moment. When heading out to photograph, try to turn thoughts, so, thoughts off such as, hmm, what am I gonna make for dinner? I have a dentist appointment tomorrow. Ooh, I've got a bill coming due on Friday. So putting those thoughts aside while we're out photographing, we allow our brain to relax and take in stimuli from our environment. And this all helps us craft and inspire our images. We can then focus on those colors, those textures, patterns, and what the light's doing in the landscape. You know, use your feeling, use your senses to get a feeling of the place. Maybe you hear running water. Maybe you can feel the breeze on your arm and it's rustling the leaves above you. Even though we rely on sight, other senses can help shape our creativity and lead us to subjects. So Yellowstone National Park is a phenomenal example of this. You can see the colors of the thermal features. You can hear the bubbling in the springs. You can feel the steam on your face. In some spots, you can even smell the earth breathing. It's a sulfur smell. I Maybe it's because I'm a crazy geologist. I love that smell. My boyfriend thinks I'm crazy, um, but I enjoy it because it, it's connecting me back to the earth and the planet. And you know what? And it's forming the environment around me. Um, so this is an image right here: thermal beams from Yellowstone National Park, kind of giving you an idea of this. And that's the sun coming up behind a tree, um, being kind of shadowed by the tree, and the beams or the light is being split up by the tree and kind of making these beautiful beams. When you leave your day-to-day -day thoughts behind, you find clarity and you start noticing shapes, colors, contrasts, and patterns. So for instance, this image, I was walking down a beach in California last year. <clears throat> and, you know, as I was walking, I admit we went out for, you know, sunset, but we just decided to go for a walk to see what we would see. And high tide was approaching. And there were these little pools full, filled with foam. And the foam was swirling around in these really cool shapes. And this reminded me of a galaxy, you know, perhaps even our own Milky Way galaxy with the spiral shape. So had I just rushed out there to wait for sunset, only focus on one thing, I would have walked right by this and I wouldn't have noticed it. This is an image from a salt playa in Death Valley. So, you know, I headed out with curiosity. I just decided to explore this playa and I found these tiny little crystals and they're salt crystals. And these were catching the last light of the day. So I enjoyed the blue shadows and the warm highlights. And just being present allows your mind to start seeing these little details. This image is a product of a wander through the dunes with no plans during a windstorm. I came across this set of dunes. I enjoyed the symmetry they displayed with the composition and the small little wispies as I refer to them, which is the light catching the back or the sand as it's blowing. Um, I just, I love wispies, so that caught my attention. And I liked how the ridges of the dunes were lighting up with that rim lighting right before the sunset. So, you know, just heading out, looking for these patterns and studying what the light's doing is what slowing down is about. Eliminating expectations. Now, this is a very hard one, especially for us photographers. Um, you know, from the start of our photography, the emphasis is placed on catching those sunrises and sunsets and vast open landscapes. While this isn't a bad thing, it creates the expectation that only those images are the proper images to capture. We've been taught to diminish blue skies um, and boring conditions, so to speak, and they're, you know, and we've been told that nothing's worth shooting midday. So part of slow photography is to challenge yourself to not have those expectations. Um, so for instance, we, we just returned from Death Valley about a month ago. We spent about three weeks there. 
Um, and we had blue skies the entire trip. We had one night of high clouds and it was blue skies the rest of the time. Um, but that, you know, instead of being disappointed with that, we went out and explored the slot canyons in Death Valley. We focused on some abstracts. Um, we went out and shot in twilight and dawn a lot. Um, focused more on the blue hour and we came back with an entirely new portfolio of images and these are images we wouldn't have had if we had just given up and not photographed in fact last year i had an encounter with a professional photographer who shall remain nameless who came up to us when we were out shooting one day during blue skies and asked us why we were wasting our time that was difficult to answer without being snarky, um, but we did, but he just shook his head and he thought we were wasting our time when we were having a wonderful time. So, oh, those great expectations. So this is a hard one for us to implement because of what I just talked about. But if you can break your grip and release them from time to time, you'll be a lot less stressful and a happier photographer. So expectations create disappointment and pressure. So here's the chain of events. So let's pretend we are at Yosemite. Um, we're up looking through tunnel view and we're expecting this grand image that we just saw on Instagram. We're super excited. We're gonna have a great sunset. Like we're gonna have clouds, unicorns, rainbows, everything. So we set up our tripod. So right off the bat, we've created pressure for ourselves. We wanna get that shot we saw on Instagram. Now we're starting to stress a little bit. Why? Because the clouds aren't doing what we thought they would do. There's no unicorn, there's no rainbow. Now we're unhappy because we gave ourselves those expectations and that stress. And what does unhappiness do to photography? It kind of does that in our brain. Oops, my clicker is not working. Hang on, let me go to my mouse. It's being very moody today. Wow, that went really far, okay. So it creates this stress ball in our brains and it harms our creativity. It boxes us in and it's very hard to get out of, especially when you're in the field with this attitude. So it prevents you from, you know, just accepting what is and looking around and being creative. So try not to get yourself involved in this equation when you're out shooting. I get it. Photography can be a heartbreaker at times and it can create moments of disappointment. You wait for all the right conditions to align and it doesn't happen. So don't head out with expectations. Try spinning it in a more positive, you know, spin those negative thoughts into more positive things. So you get up for sunrise and it's overcast. The positive, maybe the clouds have some beautiful textures and I can create a long exposure with my new set of filters. Is it rainy? Those make excellent conditions for capturing waterfalls and slowing down movement, like in this photo. Is it blue skies? This makes great conditions for black and white photos. So by being open to what nature is giving us on a particular day and not getting ourselves lost in that equation, it teaches us to be well-rounded. Those epic sunrises and sunsets don't happen every day, contrary to what you see on social media. So why not head out to challenge yourself with different conditions? So this is an example that's a perfect idea of that. Um, this is you know, about handling disappointment and turning it into something positive. So David and I went down to New Mexico to shoot Shiprock, um, which is what you see here. And we had a night of astrophotography planned. We hired a guide and we headed out and the clouds just moved right in the closer we got to the Shiprock. Um, so not ideal. So instead of heading back, being disappointed, we noticed that the clouds were moving fairly quickly. So we thought, okay, with a longer exposure, which is what you need with night photography, this might create something kind of cool. And we had a partial moon, which is how you see Shiprock lit up so nicely. This is just one exposure. Um, and I, I can't read what it is. Yeah, yeah, so about 189 seconds. And we came away with this. And I loved how the clouds were just kind of shooting out from behind Shiprock. And not only, you know, am I glad that we stayed and took the chance to photograph this, but we came away with an image that's pretty unique from a very heavily photographed place. So always work with the conditions you're given, just try your best, experiment, and you might walk away with some wonderful surprises. Same thing with Yosemite. We had three days to explore two falls ago. It was my first time visiting Yosemite National Park and we had blue skies all three days. So instead of being disappointed, we headed out out to tour the park anyway. And I found myself in this Ponderosa Grove during sunset. 
And as blue hour kind of set in afterwards, I noticed the bark on these trees picking up those blue colors and creating another, you know, just this beautiful image of, again, warm tones and cool shadows, warm highlights, cool shadows. And as you'll see here, it's something that I like to work with a lot. They're my two favorite, or my two favorite colors to work with um, since they're complementary. But I just, I enjoyed the pattern on the bark and just shooting a little bit close up. I got this wonderful maze of texture and color. And had there been clouds, this would not have happened. That glow does not happen when there's overcast skies. So it made a wonderful little abstract image. A more recent example, this was February in Utah. Um, we just went out for a hike down a trail, no expectations, and we stumbled upon some of the most fascinating ice that I've ever seen, ever. Um, just these geometric shapes, I'm not even sure how they formed. Um, and I almost went, oh, I'll catch that on the way back. Well, I'm glad I didn't because I photographed it and we headed on. Had I waited when we came back, it had completely melted and it was gone. So that's another quick little lesson. If you see something that catches your eye, don't wait till later, shoot it now. So another aspect of slowing down is trying new techniques. So this allows you to give yourself permission to play with your camera. You're gonna hear me talk about that a lot. You know, remember when we were all children, we could imagine and play all day. We experimented with things we were curious about, and if we kind of adopt that mentality again as photographers today, it allows us to be a little bit more creative and kind of get that experimental attitude back. Experimenting is a great way to slow down because, you know, it allows you to play. You know, we, I think sometimes we take ourselves a little too seriously as photographers and we just don't experiment or play enough with our cameras. So take time to try new techniques. Experimenting can turn the ordinary outing into something creative. And try, you know, using long exposures, working with filters, black and white, or intentional camera movement. And I'll touch on all of these um, in the next few slides down the road. So for example, a windy day in Yellowstone in the Upper Geyser Basin, you know, it was blue skies, some clouds, um, nothing special, but I knew that if I played with my filters, I could create a nice long exposure look. Um, this is Castle Geyser, and I enjoyed how the longer exposure kind of created that misty, soft look to the geyser and kind of, you know, misty clouds. Um, this was a 16 stop filter to help create the smoothness. And this image was perfect for processing in black and white because it was midday and I had those wonderful tones to play with. So these are what are called desert oils. Um, so since we do a lot of our exploring on the Colorado Plateau, you find these a lot in canyons. So what they are is usually along creeks or rivers, um, you'll get these puddles. And if you have any organic debris like leaves or you know grass or just something decaying in the puddle, it actually leaves behind these patches of oils. Um, I did not, you know, put my saturation slider up for these. They are truly that colorful. Um, I don't know if I have some more in my presentation, but usually they're you know any color of the rainbow. They almost look like oil slicks that you'll see in parking lots after a rain, um, but they're natural. So they 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 make just wonderful abstract subjects to work with. Um, so I got up really close to this with my macro lens, and this is an example of one of the first times that I used my macro lens to see all that it could do. Experiment with abstracts if you haven't before. You know, even something as simple as a disturbed reflection makes an abstract. So this is El Capitan in Yosemite, just reflected into a pond that had a little bit of water disturbance on it, and it just created this wonderful abstract look. And I, I enjoy how this almost looks like a painting. Um, so while, you know, reflections are known for being crisp and calm and, you know, very clear, um, don't be afraid to play with water reflections that are a little disturbed. It makes your subject a little distorted and can create some really cool abstract opportunities. And if you don't work with black and white, I encourage you to head out someday and work with black and white. Challenge yourself to get out in those midday conditions. Those contrasts create perfect black and white opportunities. So this was taken in Death Valley at literally high noon on a windy day. Um, you can kind of see the sand wispies at the top of the dunes kind of blowing off. And this is one of my favorite black and white images. Um, and this is something that if I hadn't opened my mind and not gone out at midday, I never would have caught. And this actually turned my love of sand dunes into a love of sand dunes and black and white photography as well. And if you don't, if you're not used to seeing in black and white, a lot of today's cameras have a little feature, usually picture style or somewhere else in your menus. Um, I shoot Nikon 
And there's a way that you can go in and actually have your live view um, show up in black and white. So you can actually start to train yourself to kind of see, you know, throughout the landscape, what black and whites catch your eye, you know, what kind of tones, what kind of light. Um, so I encourage you to do that if you've never played with it before. So another aspect of slowing down is getting out into nature. And I mean, head out into nature without gear, go for a hike, go for a walk, take time to notice those details without the pressure to photograph and take a hike to get back into touch with what got you into photography in the first place. I know that if I put on all my camera gear, I feel pressured when I go out every time to sometimes take a photo. So sometimes I head out without this just so I can release those expectations and just enjoy nature. And sometimes I discover things that I wanna photograph later and I can always come back to it. And I know it sounds really corny, but it can really help your mind, especially during you know creative slumps or times when you just don't feel like photographing. And a good example of that is this slide. So this picture here is an example of just that. This image actually rescued me from one of the worst creative slumps that I've had. It's normal to get into these slumps, but it can be challenging. So I hit a wall where I wasn't feeling creative and I didn't photograph for about a month. And one night in California, we went for a walk down the beach, excuse me. And I noticed that when the waves retreated, they were leaving these wonderful sand patterns behind. And I watched this for quite a few minutes and all of a sudden I was excited again. And I returned the next evening, it was high tide again. And luckily the same thing was happening. So I photographed it and this rescued me from one of my creative slumps um, and my love of abstracts, you know, kind of came back and I felt creative again. So by keeping that bond with nature, it helped me navigate my way out of my slump. So even if you don't feel like photographing, keep that mental connection by getting out into nature and it's just very essential and it'll help you. Slow photography is also about photographing the interests that you have subjects that you're passionate about. Be your own creative director. You know, maybe you connect with waterfalls or, you know, running water, or maybe you enjoy wildlife or perhaps flowers. You know, when you take time to photograph what you're passionate about and what interests you, your viewer will have an, or a much easier time connecting with you and your photo. So take the time to be curious about your surroundings and how nature works. So be that, you know, like I said, be your own creative director, photograph for yourself first, don't photograph for the masses, don't photograph for what's popular, getting the most attention, always stay authentic and true to yourself and photograph for you. Don't let social media dictate what you share or photograph, shoot what excites you and your viewer will have a better time connecting with your image. So anyone that has followed me for a while knows I'm obsessed with mud. It sounds ridiculous, I know. There are bumper stickers that say, I break for ice cream or I break for wildlife. Well, mine should be, I break for mud. I've garnered plenty of crazy looks in the field while there's something amazing going on in the landscape and I'm bent over photographing some mud texture. I just get a lot of joy out of photographing these smaller scenes. I like the way the light interacts with the mud tiles. Um, this is an example at blue hour. So the mud is actually, the mud is not blue, but it's white mud but it's reflecting blue hour. So with a little bit, you know, it's not really even a long exposure. It's just, this is the way it looks during blue hour. And my camera picked up those blues and you can see just a little bit of highlight on that one little mud peel. So, you know, I've had other professional photographers tell me don't waste your time with scenes like this, but they make me happy. And that's more important to me than pleasing everyone else. So don't give up, you know, photographing what you like. Um, it's, you'll be more authentic and true to yourself if you stick to what you really enjoy doing. Same thing with dolphins. So I have a wild dolphin project that I work on that I'll talk a little bit more about later. And photography helped me marry my passion of ocean life and dolphins with my photography. Um, this was a personal project that I started when I was grieving the loss of my mother. And these photos touch people more than any of my other photos. They connect with people. And the messages that I get from people that, you know, they form their own opinions about, it's, it's just amazing to see. And it's something that's very personal to me. So when you make it personal, it, it's personal to your viewer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I'm, you know, passionate about geology and photography. So I like combining both of those interests in Yellowstone. 
the colors, the textures, and the patterns that the thermophiles make, so these are the heat-loving bacteria that you see around the thermal features, create just absolutely stunning and mesmerizing patterns. So it's a subject that, you know, compels me and keeps me excited to shoot. This was one of my favorite abstracts that I photographed in Yellowstone about a year and a half ago um, with a 400 millimeter lens from standing on an overlook. And it was just crazy. I, I couldn't tell you what made this. I'm not even quite sure what it is, but it's, it's just one of the craziest things I've ever seen. So how do we put this all together? So after practicing slow photography for a while, I've come up with this method to help others slow down in the field. I teach this to my students on my workshops and it really helps them kind of take their time and slow down. So it's called the C method. Please prevent the corner, you know, forgive me for the corniness. It just happened to work this way, so bear with me. So it's about surveying, exploring, and experimenting. So surveying. We often encourage our students to leave their camera or to leave their tripods in their bag or just to the side. Um, this prevents what I like to call tripod hole syndrome. We've all seen it. You know, we can all get tunnel vision. We see something amazing. We rush out. We set our tripods down and then we don't move for like an hour. Um, and, you know, that kind of that, that doesn't help us slow down and see the entire field in front of us. Um, so by, you know, by putting that tripod down, keeping it aside, not committing to a shot right away, unless, you know, there's something amazing happening that's not going to last long, you know, that's the caveat. But I encourage you to, you know, just walk around with your camera in hand, perhaps. Even our cell phones make wonderful cameras. Um, we all have them. They're in our back pockets. They're kind of equivalent to a wide angle lens. Um, so I just sometimes head out and kind of frame things to look at the land. And that way I'm not pressured to shoot right away, but I can still find something. So I want you guys to take a kind of a grocery list of everything that you see in a scene. This is also referred to as a visual inventory. So for instance, I've got this scene in Death Valley. Um, these are the Ibex dunes in the Southern part of the park. We did happen to catch these with stormy conditions and windy conditions, but let's just take a quick look at everything we see in this scene. So we have storm clouds and light, We've got mountains, we've got ridges, light patches, some shadows. I know it's hard to see on my, or maybe on all of our screens, but there are ripples in the sand down there. And there's blowing sand. So there are those wispies I was talking about earlier. So I've now taken a scene like this and I've broken it down into this. So now I kind of have a little bit of an idea of maybe what I wanna work with because these grand scenes can be very chaotic and it's easy to get overwhelmed when you see these because there's so much going on. But by taking that visual inventory, you can actually walk away with more imagery versus just maybe one scene. So I also, I often, or I've heard one photographer say that there's only one shot at every location on earth. That's it. Like don't waste your time with other shots. And that's, that's ridiculous. I've never heard anything so silly. Um, so every grand scene has these little stories and, you know, it's, it challenges yourself to find these stories. It grows your eye and it helps your vision along. And, you know, kind of like I said, before we started this, one of my favorite things about workshops is we all go to the same place, but we don't necessarily all shoot the same thing. So at the end of the workshop, it's always fascinating to see what the students have, you know, photographed and no one has the same photo. It's, it's so wonderful to see. And it would be very boring if we all photograph the same way, process the same way, you know, we all see differently. And that's what I love celebrating about this craft. And a question that I usually get is, do I still do this in the field myself? And the answer is absolutely. Um, I can still fall victim to being overwhelmed, especially at like canyon vistas, um, sand dune fields, mountain scenes. It can be very overwhelming. So I will take the time, just one minute, just to go, you know, I see this, I see sand dunes, I see mountains, I see storm clouds. It sounds elementary, but it really helps your brain. So these are some examples of four images that I walked away from that evening. So we have sand ripples here. So these tiny little ripples caught my eye and I enjoyed the way the light was hitting this one dune. I pointed my camera down. I noticed these rays of sand just kind of radiating out from a point and I enjoyed the last bit of light hitting those. Here I enjoyed playing with those sand wispies again. 
And this was actually shot during blue hour after about an hour, about 45 minutes after the sunset. Um, you get this very beautiful purple blue glow to the dunes. And I enjoyed this little scene. So that was, you know, four images and five, if you include the grand landscape that I did shoot before too. And I walked away with five images that night. So by taking the time to slow down and do that visual inventory, it gave me, you know, a lot of time to maximize the opportunities when shooting that night. So exploring, a big part of slowing down is exploring, like I said earlier. So when you're exploring, you're not in a hurried state and you are allowing your mind to wander while you wander the landscape. A study done by University of California found evidence that people who let their minds wander are a lot more creative and better problem solvers. So research has also shown that physical exercise helps you out of left brain dominant thinking and you instead adopt a more creative mindset. So exploring is just that. We're walking around, taking in the sights and sounds of our environment. You're a more deliberate photographer when you do that. And when you take your time to explore, you're not in a hurry, you're not in a rush, and you're giving yourself that permission to take in the landscape. So take time to explore new areas, familiar areas, maybe different weather, different seasons, scout areas that you've previously scouted, um, see how different seasons affect different landscapes. And on this next slide here, I've kind of broken it down. So use your senses kind of like I talked about in Yellowstone, you know, get that full sense of your landscape and, you know, really a sense of presence. Explore off the beaten path, go explore somewhere you haven't explored before. Take a hike without gear, like I said earlier, just sometimes doing that frees us from those expectations. Revisit locations during different light and weather conditions. Um, maybe you have a favorite tree that you want to photograph in each different season. Maybe it looks different in different weather conditions. And, you know, like a, then up there, you know, revisit locations during different seasons. So this is, I tried to find a way to encompass what I'm talking about and how I explore and wander the landscape. So this is a screenshot from Gaia, um, which I take out with me when I go explore and I hike. And all these different paths and different colors, this is the same area. But all of these tracks are just me exploring, wandering aimlessly, following what my eye sees, what I'm curious about. You'll see very few straight lines. There is one little straight line here in the light blue color, but then you can see I went, whoa, wait a minute, what about over here? And then I circle back again. Um, so this is just a good visual of what I mean when I say explore. Now, if this was a trail, obviously I would stay on the trail, um, but maybe take my time and explore things that catch my eye along the trail. So these images were all taken from one evening on one playa in Death Valley, and they represent knowing a place and reacting to weather conditions. So over the last few years, I've gotten to know Death Valley extremely well. And you know, we typically spend about two to three months there every winter um, teaching and exploring the park. And a few winters ago, we had a lot of rain, which is very rare in Death Valley. And I knew this one playa would collect rainwater when it did rain heavily, and then it would dry out after a few days and just reset mud patterns. So I knew that by exploring previously. So we went out, we gave the rain about three days to dry up. It doesn't take long out there in the desert. And we were greeted with all of these mud patterns, um, everything from peeling mud to these really cool colors and textures. The one, the fissures picture is actually mud that has frozen and then warmed again. So that's how you get those little feathered patterns. And, you know, had we not explored or known that, we might have missed this. So just a good example of, you know, getting out to explore. This is another example from Death Valley. So this is 2019 to 2021. Same playa, same area. There are those salt crystals I was referencing. So in 2019, they were dry. Uh, last year, 2020, they were actually floating in puddles. So you'll actually see that middle image. There's a few salt crystals that have broken loose and they're floating. And then this February, the same area, no water, no floating crystals, not even cubes, but instead these funkier kind of patterns that I had never seen before. Um, almost remind me of like snakeskin. So this is just a great example. Even if you've explored a place once, keep going back chances are you're going to see something different every time. 
So this is a photo from Grand Teton National Park. So we know by, you know, from spending time there that storms that kind of blow in right before sunset and clear offer wonderful opportunities for atmospheric conditions. So anytime we see a storm rolling in, we, we try to get out so we can have a view of the mountains to try to catch this. Um, I really enjoy these atmospheric photos. I'm inspired a lot by Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran. Um, they went out and painted what is now our national parks. Um, and if you know their work, you know that they're very dreamy and atmospheric. So especially when I'm around mountains, I feel compelled to kind of recreate that. So a little note on weather. You don't have to be a meteorologist to really understand weather. You know, David and I spend a lot of time out in the field, getting out in different conditions to see what kind of happens. Um, we do use an app called Windy, that's W-I-N-D-Y. That's really helpful. We use this to predict fog, um, tides on the ocean, you know, when it's gonna rain, when we might get frozen ice. Um, it's just a really great app to use. I believe there's a free version and a paid version. You can do so much with the free version, but I encourage you to look that up and, you know, maybe give it a whirl if you're really interested in getting to know weather better. Um, you know, it's kind of like street smarts. You're going to know what you enjoy shooting, what weather conditions you like working with by getting out there and just experiencing it. I know it can sometimes not be so fun when it's snowy, rainy, cold, but really getting out there will yield some very interesting conditions and photographic opportunities. So like I said, I spend a lot of time in Yellowstone National Park. So here are the lower falls. This was taken in June when you can see a rainbow at the base at about 10 a.m. And we all know this image. It's a very well-known spot, but I've also gone back and visited in other conditions. So here's mid at like late afternoon with backlight sun, lighting up the mist from the waterfall. I've been there in foggy conditions. I've thought, oh, something's gonna happen and I show up and it's socked in. But sometimes if you have that patience, the fog will clear and you'll be rewarded with a scene like this. So when you're patient enough, you'll get those opportunities. Another example of this is, um, this is Bridal Veil Fall in Yosemite National Park. <clears throat> David and I were just out exploring the park no plan in mind. I had never seen tunnel view. So we went up there, we parked, we got out of our car and I had polarized sunglasses on, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And through my polarized sunglasses, I saw this rainbow in the waterfall and it just, it was happenstance that we were there at just whatever time the sun was at the proper angle to light up the waterfall in a complete rainbow for about five minutes. And I just lost my mind. I was like, oh my goodness, I got out my camera. I thought this was the most exciting thing I had ever seen. Um, but it was really cool to see. And it was just by getting out there and just exploring and you know, learning to work with midday light. I don't want you guys to think about there's best light to work with and bad light. Instead, I want you guys to kind of think of different opportunities of light. So then that there again, it's turning that negative into a positive. And visit during different seasons. This is Yellowstone National Park after a late snowstorm or an early snowstorm, excuse me, during the fall. You already have the steam to work with, but then we had these icy snowy conditions that were really cool. Another example from Yellowstone, this is looking down from Canary Spring um, and the Mammoth Terraces. This is actually all dried up now, sadly. The spring stopped running last July. No one knows if it'll come back or when it will come back, but it has a history of being dormant and active. So hopefully again, sometime this century, it'll come back. Um, but this is just an example of two different days. So the one on the right, liquefied, was taken under overcast conditions where you really see those colors kind of come through. And the next one was taken the next day, just a little bit over from this image, same little delta though. And the blue that you see is actually the blue sky reflecting. So it looks totally different. This was midday light on the left, cloudy day on the right. So even if you've been there before, you've seen it, visit it in different conditions, it'll really give you opportunities. So here's Death Valley again. This is good about kind of changing your perspective. So we're all familiar with this shot. This is Zabriskie Point, one of the most popular areas in the park. Um, and while this is lovely in and of itself, if you take the time to explore these badlands, you'll see more opportunities. So you are allowed to walk around down here. Um, you're not gonna harm things. They kind of reset their actual trails that are already there. So if you're ever here, I encourage you to kind of walk down from the viewpoint and go explore. 
you'll start to see different colors, different layers, different textures. Um, you know, these layers make wonderful abstract subjects like this one. Play with different light. This was kind of late afternoon light. So these badlands kind of had a really nice, pretty glow. And then here, right before the sun heads down the mountains, you get this beautiful sun ray pattern if you line your lens up right. And I just liked how it was bathing these badlands in warmth. And just an example of scouting. So a few summers ago, I went out to Crested Butte. I scouted behind Gothic Mountain here on a trail. And I had this mental image in my mind when I saw this. And I said, OK, there are loop in here. This would make maybe a nice sunset or sunrise. So I made a mental note to come back when we had high clouds. And sure enough, a week later, we had high clouds. And I created this wonderful little sunset image. So I know that sometimes we may not always have the opportunity to arrive early and explore, especially if we're on vacation or we've got limited travel time. So I highly encourage you to show up maybe a few days before to really give yourself that time to scout and explore so you can take these mental notes and head back when you have the weather conditions that you wish to have. So experimenting, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about. So experimenting really helps play into not having expectations. Why? Because we're not always sure of the outcome. We need to allow ourselves to experiment and have that childlike wonder. So experimenting is perfect from that because when you're running an experiment, you're not sure what the outcome may be. So naturally, it's a great way to release expectations. So experimenting with different lenses, filters, playing with intentional camera movement, which is what this is can really expand your photography horizons. They cause you to work more slowly and deliberately in the field. And if you fail, just keep trying. If you're not failing, you're not learning. I have hundreds of failures that I'd be more than happy to share with you guys someday. We all do it. Um, and that's how we learn. So intentional camera movement is one of my favorite ways to experiment. So this was actually taken by moving my camera while I exposed. So this is a little meadow of flower, flowers in Crested Butte. And I just did about a quarter second and I moved while I clicked the shutter and it gave it this very kind of Monet painting look to it. So give yourself that permission to experiment, play with multiple exposures if you never have, change your perspective. Maybe instead of always photographing with your tripod at eye level, get down or maybe expand even higher. Play with different shutter speeds like that ICM or a longer shutter speed with a stream or a waterfall. Try a different technique, black and white, macro lens, telephoto lens, and try different subjects that you're not used to photographing. So here's another example of intentional camera movement, except this time I took a zoom lens and just zoomed out while I shot again at about a quarter second as well. It just kind of gave this tree a very cool look. Here's an example of slowing down water. So this is um, Zion Canyon here in the reflection when in the orange that you can actually see. So you couldn't see this when the water was moving, you know, with your own eyes, you couldn't pick this up. But by slowing down to about a quarter of a second, all of a sudden this kind of comes into blue or view, excuse me. And you can kind of see like a very faint blue outline here around the orange. And that's actually the blue sky. Experiment with a telephoto and maybe experiment with water abstracts. So depending on what the water is reflecting, you can create endless abstracts. These were simply just the white clouds in the sky reflecting on Jenny Lake and Grand Teton. Here's another take of the sand dunes using a telephoto lens. So I know we're all used to using our wide angle lenses um, because that's usually what we're taught as beginner photographers. I still enjoy shooting wide, but I encourage you if that's all you've been shooting, pick up a mid-range or a telephoto lens and take a break from that wide angle. This was photographed with a 600 millimeter lens to give a, the dune field kind of an abstract look. So I was standing across the road up on a higher vantage point. You know, that helps you, you know, isolate out smaller elements in a large scene too by using a telephoto. There's so many smaller stories in the grand landscape and a telephoto lens is great for picking those out. Here's another example looking down from Dante's Peak. So if any of you are familiar with Badwater in Death Valley, this is Badwater right here. I'm just looking down on it from a very high vantage point. And I used my zoom lens to kind of zoom in on those salt textures to kind of create a very artistic effect. And challenge yourself to get out midday. So like I said earlier, dunes are an amazing way to challenge your black and white eye. 
Um, this was during a sandstorm about 1 p.m. on the dunes. Um, you can see the sand blowing in the atmosphere, the layers of the dunes and the layers of the mountains just all kind of create a very compelling photo. So those are the three techniques to help you slow down in the field. So take those visual inventories, take time to explore and revisit locations you've previously photographed, give yourself permission to play and experiment, and you don't have to be anywhere exotic to implement these techniques. You can even start in your own backyard. So now I'm just gonna dive a little bit into storytelling. So slow photography and storytelling go hand in hand because you need to slow down and observe to find these stories in the landscape. From a grand viewpoint to tiny salt crystals, every landscape has a story to tell. So I'm gonna go over some of the techniques I find helpful in sharing these stories. Um, and that's through compositional elements, using my own feelings, using emotion, um, how to find the subject and photographing what you're passionate about. But first, a little history. So humans have been expressing themselves with artwork for thousands of years. Even cave paintings tell a story. We're visual creatures by nature, so we are drawn to these expressions. Landscape painters told stories with their paintings, and we as photographers follow in their footsteps. Paintings were an important asset in setting aside these magical places for future national parks. So these painters would go out west, paint what they saw, and then they would send them back to Congress to show them these wonderful places that needed to be protected. So in a way, that's how we do our photography as well. We want to convey a message. Um, you know, maybe it was something that we want other people that they couldn't be there in person to experience, but we want to share. Same principle. And these are those two landscape painters that I referenced earlier. You can see how they're very atmospheric and dreamy. So great photography is about depth of feeling, not depth of field. Now don't take that too literally. Of course, it's about depth of field occasionally. But what Peter Adams is just trying to say here is, you know, don't be afraid to use your feelings in photography. It's our job to tell the story and present it to the viewer in an impactful way. And it's our interpretation of a scene to the world. So we want to tell a story to help capture the viewer's attention. In a sea full of photos, the ones that tell a story or have some background to them stand out better. We might want to tell a story about what we were feeling when we photographed that photo. Maybe it's about the subject that we're shooting. Maybe we want to convey a message about conservation. Maybe we're using the elements in the landscape to share that story or tell a narrative. Creating art that invites our viewers to ask questions and to connect is what we really want. It keeps them in our frame longer, and that's pretty much our ultimate goal with our photography. So photog photographs are believed more than words. Thus, they can be used persuasively to show people who have never taken the trouble to look what is there. This is a quote from Elliot Porter, one of my favorite photographers. Um, he was considered the grandfather of small scenes um, because he was the first to really present those to people. And I follow a lot in his footsteps with my love of smaller scenes. So for instance, I use this composition to convey a large amount of space around this leaf just to give it that solitary, isolated feeling. This leaf is all alone in a maze of sandstone striations. This leaf was far away from trees, so I was left wondering how he arrived there and hoped that my viewer would ask the same question. I composed this purposely by leaving a lot of that negative space around the leaf to communicate that isolation. And no, I did not put the leaf there. Some people ask that. I do not do that. I stumbled upon this on a hike in Zion National Park. Um, there were trees quite a distance away, so I'm just assuming that this guy caught some wind and floated on over here. But I couldn't help but feel that he was a little isolated. This is another scene from um, southern Colorado where I wanted to convey a message. So these, this forest of bare trees that you see were actually all aspen trees. And the one tree that remains that you see the leaves on is actually an aspen tree. So the night before we had visited this hillside, it was covered in aspen leaves, gold, beautiful. We had a major windstorm that night. We went out the next morning to see the damage and this tree was left all alone. And I still don't know how everyone around him lost all of their leaves except for him. And I enjoyed the way that this fir tree on the right was kind of looking, so to speak, at this tree on the left. And it's almost like they're looking at each other going, you know, what happened? So I named it survivors because they truly were the survivors of the windstorm. So 
by using those compositional elements and by my placement of the two trees and all that negative space of bare trees, I tried to convey that message. Here's a message that I wanted to convey of renewal and hope, and I used colors to do that. So when our eyes see these happy greens and blues and warm light, we're drawn to that because way back in the day, our ancestors were drawn to these green places because it meant shelter, food, and water. So these types of images really relate with people because we still like those colors that we see and they give us a sense of calm and peace. So this was just a little um, photo that I stumbled upon in the Colorado wilderness backpacking a few years ago and it just looked like something right out of a fairy tale. Purples and yellows, another way to use complementary colors. Um, so this was taken in Yellowstone a few autumns ago. At the time, there was actually two volcanoes over in Russia erupting. So when they erupt, they release aerosols up into the stratosphere and these scatter blue light. So when you combine a red sunset or a red sunrise with these, it creates a purple hue. So if you ever hear of a volcano erupting, you know, head out even on a blue sky night and you might see this pretty purple hue. Um, it's pretty intense and it's really cool to see. So here's an example, a blue sky day. We wouldn't have had this. Um, Old Faithful is erupting and it just made a nice backdrop. And the purple and the yellows and the oranges are complementary, so they're pleasing to the eye. I also like to use metaphors and anthropomorphism to describe a lot of my photos. Anthropomorphizing means that you attribute human characteristics to an object or an animal, and I find it makes the feelings and emotions more relatable. Um, so we all have feelings, and some of us may not be comfortable sharing our emotions with words, but we can with our imagery. So these are trees in Yellowstone in winter. They're um, covered in what's called rime ice. So what happens is the steam, which you can kind of see in the background, continually barrages these trees. Ice forms, then it snows, then the cycle repeats. So these trees get weighed down with this heavy ice and snow. So when I saw this little clump of trees, especially the tree in front, I thought, this guy must be exhausted. He's been carrying this weight all winter. Um, so some feelings might be despair, exhaustion, possibly maybe hope because the sun is shining. Maybe today is the day that those icy chains will melt and this little tree might be freed. Another example from Death Valley, this is a windstorm on the dunes. There was a creosote bush, which you can see in the middle there. And he just looked like he was hanging on for dear life. And I liked how the dunes were almost protecting him. So immediately I thought this little guy's taking shelter. So I named the image sheltered. Um, I felt that the dunes were protecting him in this really harsh condition. You could also say maybe he's alone and isolated as well. And sometimes we can insert our own experiences into our photography. So this is promise of a new day. This was taken in Death Valley and it was taken during a time that I was having a lot of stress with my mom. Um, she was diagnosed with a terminal illness a few years ago. She was having a really hard time. Um, I had gotten a call from the hospital on this particular day. I was really stressed out. So after the phone call, I went out to the dunes and just went out to explore, get out into nature, try to de-stress. And I saw the sun setting behind this dune. And it gave me hope that even though today is really stressful, tomorrow is a new day. So normally I write that in the caption of this photo so people can kind of follow along because they may not always be able to get that feeling from this image. They're not gonna know my story. But by adding text to our photos and giving that background story really gives it that impact. So don't be afraid to use your own emotions in your imagery. Here's another one that was kind of metaphors and anthropomorphism. So this is a rare rainstorm in Death Valley. Um, it fell on the Badlands the night before. The next day, the sun came out. They started drying and heating up and we got mist and steam rising off of them. So this is an area that used to be mined for borax. So lots of miners and people came through here and I couldn't help but the mist rising up almost reminded me of spirits, like maybe it's the ghosts of the miners. So it's very mysterious, it's very moody, and it's intriguing. And then sometimes they just remind you of things and you can tell a story that way. So this is an example of a metaphor. This is a thermal abstract in Yellowstone National Park. It reminded me of reptile skin. It almost looks like you could reach out and touch it and it would be very bumpy. So I named it reptilian. Another example, this is actually a great example of just what you can find wandering around. 
I could lie and say that this is deep in the backcountry and it took me 20 days of hike or 20 miles of hiking to get here. It was a puddle right outside our campsite. So this was in June. So when the trees are releasing their pollen, it falls down. We had had some rain and this was a puddle and the pollen had organized itself, <clears throat> excuse me, in these almost topographic patterns. Hang on one second. So my geology background, I worked with topographic maps a lot. So that's what it reminded me of. So, you know, don't be afraid to use your own experiences from things you've done in life too, to remind you of things when you're photographing. And this photo, Forsaken, this is my favorite tree in Yellowstone National Park. I should have a name for him, but I don't. He hangs out by the lower falls here. And I just connected with this tree when I saw it. He's alone. There are other trees above him. There are some below him, but he's on this rocky outcrop all by himself. So I couldn't help but wonder, you know, how did he get there? How did he come to be? And it gave me a forlorn feeling, you know, he, it almost made me think that he's forsaken just being left on this rock. So I photographed him with the backlit mist behind him to add to that intrigue. And it's one of my favorite pictures. So where are the stories? Every landscape has a plethora of these little stories. When you take the time to slow down and look for these smaller stories, it all comes together as a bigger picture. So this is a scene of Mount Sneffels in Colorado in the San Juan Mountains. It's a beautiful grand landscape. Here there was a storm clearing above Mount Sneffels during the autumn, but I took the time to look a little closer and do my visual inventory and I found some other little scenes. So before I show you the next picture, if you were to walk like a quarter mile from this scene, from this photo, you would have a different angle on the trees. These trees actually right here in the foreground. And that's where this picture comes into light. So I used my telephoto right before the sun disappeared and I photographed this little stand of Aspen. This little stand got me thinking and I enjoyed the way that some of the trees had lost their leaves near the base. And I zoomed in and I found this little scene. So right there, we've got three little stories in one landscape. So slow down and look for those stories. Going back to um, this example of Yellowstone National Park. So again, we've got a visual inventory going on. I went way too fast. So what do we have here? We've got a waterfall. We've got some interesting rocks. This is geothermally altered rhyolite on the canyon walls. So if you look closely, you see all sorts of cracks and colors in this rock. You've got water texture in the waterfall. You've got these trees and colorful rocks on the left. You've got this little tree, my favorite tree. So that's the one I just showed you in that other photo. And we've got some rainbow going on and some mist at the base here. And we have more trees. So by taking that inventory, these are the photos I walked, with, walked away with that day. So we've got the grand scene up on the left. We've got that rhyolite, that rock that I pointed out there. That's what it looks like close up with a telephoto lens. We've got a nice little rainbow, kind of an abstract look at the base of the falls and the trees. We've got working with the rainbow in the waterfall. This was actually before the full rainbow formed, the one on the bottom left there. So you just had little glimpses of color. So I photographed that. It almost reminds me of a butterfly. And then you've got, I just chose one with the rainbow with the backdrop for these trees, this nice little stand of trees. And then there was one more story that I saw that was actually unfolding before my very eyes, right in the square. So there are these violet green swallows that take residence in the canyon walls during the spring and the summer. And as I was taking my telephoto lens around, I noticed them swooping down into the mist collecting bugs. And then they'd fly back up to the canyon walls and they'd swoop down again. So I was fascinated by this. And these are not my photos of the birds on the right. I'm not quite that talented with bird photography, um, but these are just what they look like just so you guys could see. And I did happen to catch two flying into my frame. I won't tell you how many frames I took to get those two. It was a while, but I finally caught one and I just loved the look of it. So I named it serendipity because it was one of those serendipitous moments that you don't plan on, that you encounter. And it's one of my favorite photos. So always look for those little stories. And then finally, the last part I'm gonna talk about real quick here are photography projects. 
So photography projects are wonderful for sharing stories, feelings, they exercise our photographer brains, and there's something we can always work on. And they combine storytelling and slow photography. So remember when I said earlier, storytelling is a way to slow down? Well, photo projects are a great way to practice this. They consist of multiple images that collectively share a story or a theme. They're a great way to not only grow your photography, but they keep you inspired and challenged and they help you grow. I know they keep me inspired and I usually always have a photography project sitting on the back burner somewhere and I kind of feel lost if I don't have one. So sometimes they, you know, one image isn't enough to tell a story that we've stumbled upon. So projects are a great way to tell that whole story with a variety of different images. You can make a project to showcase a newly learned technique um, maybe you're learning black and white or you're playing with your macro lens. They can showcase something you're passionate about, um, share the story of a favorite place. Maybe it's a hobby that you're doing. Maybe it's nothing photography related at all, but you want to document it. Another idea, idea is to document something that you love. Maybe you have a favorite tree to photograph like I do in Yellowstone and you want to see how it looks in different weather and seasons. Projects give you a sense of, a sense of accomplishment and they keep you motivated. You can add writing to a project to give it even more meaning and depth. And now I'm just gonna share with you just about four or five of my own projects just to kind of give you an idea. So here, one last show is from Zion National Park. So remember those oils I was talking about earlier? Here's a good example of how colorful they are. Um, I don't enhance my colors, my photo processing technique. I'm in and out of Lightroom and Photoshop in about five minutes. I'm not a technical person. I don't like working with that stuff just because I feel like it slows me down. I try to shoot it as real as I can in the field. And then I will play with my, you know, temperatures a little bit, my exposures, but I really am in and out of my processing in five minutes. Um, David makes fun of me, but it's just, it's what I'm comfortable with. So if you're curious, if I really like pop these colors, no, this is what they literally look like if you just stumbled upon them. So I wanted to show a collection of leaves and oils in Zion. I felt that one image alone wasn't enough to tell this complete story. So I photographed the collection. And the theme of this project is that there is beauty and death sometimes. These leaves had fallen from their trees after an autumn of showcasing their colors. They died, they fell off into these puddles, and they created beauty on the ground with these colorful displays of oils as they decayed. So even in their death, they've created a colorful autumn and they still leave beauty behind. So this project is an example of a theme and it tells a story. Heading back to my little exhausted tree. So, you know, winter in Yellowstone is a magical time to experience. There's substantially less people, the park is quiet, and you get these snowy beautiful scenes in the thermal areas. So these trees are all covered in that rime ice that I was talking about earlier. So I essentially gave these trees kind of humanistic characteristics and I made a little project. So marooned, this little set of trees was marooned around these very hot thermal features. I liked that they were huddled together. I liked how these trees all of a sudden kind of came out of the steam. There's my exhausted tree, gatekeepers. I kind of liked how there were these two trees on either side and the steam was kind of funneling through, kind of like they're you know keeping a gate protected. Face off, here's a rime covered tree with some steam on the other side. It looked like they were facing off. And then the last picture, you've got some semi covered adult trees, but the little juvenile trees in front of those trees are completely covered. So I called that future generation. So I put together this collection to show the different trees and anthropomorphize them and it tells a story. Here's another Yellowstone. So here are all of my abstracts that I photographed. Um, I have more, but I, I've added this project, but this was kind of what I started out with. And this combines my love of abstract photography with geology. Um, I call Yellowstone my Disneyland because every time I go I'm very giddy and I'm like a kid in a candy store. There's just so much to see and experience. Um, so I wanted to showcase the colors and the patterns that these thermophiles kind of created and I put them together in a project. So it combines a theme with something that I'm passionate about. And then I put this project together in quarantine last year. We all had a very stressful year last year. This was actually, or excuse me, no, this isn't the quarantine one. Sorry, they're both blue. 
rewind. So this is a project about blue textures. So these were all photographed in different places and that's okay because with this image I just, or this project, I wanted to showcase textures and patterns that all had a blue hue. So some are mud textures, some are ice, and one is actually salt. They have a common theme in the way of colors and textures, and they go to show that even if you have some images in your collection that you think look nice together, that you just want to put together, they can have that theme of commonality. So we've got wet mud up here on the top left. We've got dried mud in the middle. These are salt crystals on the very right. And on the bottom, we've got more salt crystals, and then I've got some ice. So my dolphin project. So now this brings us to this. So this one has a lot of personal meaning to me. I know it's not a landscape, but I always add it in here as an example of something that's personal to you. So back in 2017, my mother lost her battle with her incredibly cruel illness. And as expected, I was completely devastated. So we were actually in Death Valley when she passed away teaching a workshop. The irony there is just deafening. Um, the ER doctor even thought I was making a cruel joke when he called me to tell me and he asked me where I was and I said I'm in Death Valley and he paused awkwardly and I'm like, no, I, I am really in Death Valley and he was like, oh, okay, like I'm not making a bad joke. Um, so we flew back to Illinois for the funeral, we came back to Death Valley and David wanted to get me out of there. So we headed to the California coast just to regroup. And my, I grew up in a family full of scuba divers. So my dad was, an, he is an underwater photographer. And my mom introduced me to diving too. And dolphins were something that we had in common. So David and I went out whale watching. I had zero expectations. He just wanted to get me out into something that I loved, which was the ocean. And we found these dolphins and these are wild common dolphins. They're present in thousands off the California coast year round. And an idea came to me. So it was comforting to get back out on the water and I wanted to photograph them. Dolphins are very humanistic as well. They, they lead lives very similar to us, even though it's underwater. So I photographed them in black and white because I felt like that kind of represented my grieving process. If we've all grieved somebody, which I'm sure we have, you've got those very dark days and you've got those happier days where you've come to peace. And the black and white represented that to me. So my very dark days, my days where I was at peace and all the gray tones in between the constant roller coaster of emotion. So I put this project together and it was something that I wasn't gonna show the world. And David encouraged me to put it out there to maybe, you know, encourage others that maybe had a similar experience. So I did, I put it out there and it received a lot of attention. I still get stories to this day, how this project just touches people somehow. And I still continue this project to this day. Even though these were the six first images that I captured, I still head out every year to California. We head out by boat and I try to capture these. And these were taken above the water with a telephoto lens from the bow of the boat. You need extremely calm ocean conditions, which does not happen often. Um, I won't tell you how many frames I've gone through or days that I've gone through to get these images. It's very challenging, but well worth it in the end. And I continue this project to this day. So here is something, a little different take on it. So we went out a few years ago and there were some clouds reflecting on the water and it just gave these dolphins an otherworldly appearance, almost like they were going in between our world and their own world. Um, so you can always continue a project. You don't have to stop it at five images, six images. You can keep these going for as long as you want. Um, and I continue to add to these to these day or to this day. So here's the one I meant to talk about earlier. So this is, I like to call quarantine ice. So last year was super stressful for all of us. Um, we were in quarantine here in Colorado. We had no idea when we were going back out on the road to teach. <clears throat> our livelihood was at stake, super stressful. We obviously didn't pick up our cameras for a while. And then one day in spring, um, we had had some snow and then typical Denver weather, it snows, it melts, it snows, it melts. And this ice formed on my driveway. So I saw it one day going out to the mailbox and I said, ooh, with a macro lens, like some of this would be kind of cool. So I grabbed my camera and stood there in my driveway and photographed this. And, you know, I didn't go anywhere exotic. It was right in my backyard. And it was an example of giving me creativity again during a very stressful time when that was completely gone. 
So it was my first motivation to have that creative spark. And I found myself shooting again. So I challenge you to go out and create a photo project, whether it's from files on your hard drive or something you can go out and shoot now. Um, shoot in different weather, familiar scenes, shoot a favorite tree in every season, you know, photograph something outside of photography. They don't have to be from faraway places. You don't have to travel to Iceland to get a project. As long as there's something you enjoy shooting and they represent something personal to you, create them. The sky is the limit. And if you'd like to see other examples of projects, you would be interested in this. Um, this is Lenswork Magazine. They put out a series of books the last few years called Seeing in Sixes. Every book is a collection of 50 different projects, all genre of photography, from nature to portraits to street photography, architecture, everything, um, black and white and color. And I had the honor of being in three of these books with my own projects. Um, but if you enjoy these projects, they're very inspiring books to just flip through and open up. Every project has a story. You can still find them on Lenswork. I believe the 2016 book is sold out, but you can. someone told me you can still find it on Amazon. But if photo projects are something you're into, I encourage you to pick those up. And if you're interested in seeing other photographers talk about slow photography and what it means to them, I encourage you to check out the Slow Photography Movement blog. I'm a staff contributor and writer to the movement. Um, it's me and two other photographers. Um, lots of viewpoints and perspectives and stories and photography on there um, that just shows how slow photography has helped them connect with the landscape. So I encourage you to visit there. And just the final thoughts, take the time to slow down. Use that C method to help you. Use your emotions and feelings to help tell a story with your photography. Challenge yourself and give yourself permission to play with your lens and your camera. Search out those smaller stories in the larger landscape. Experiment, don't be afraid to fail, learn, curate a photo project and create something personal to you. And more importantly, be your own creative director and stay true to your work. If you'd like to see more of my work or get in touch with me, or if you want to share a photography project that you have, I love when people share those things with me. Please don't be shy. You can find me at jenniferrenwick.com. That's my website. Um, you can subscribe to my mailing list. I, sub I put out a newsletter about, yeah, it's, it's quarter or like quarterly, um, unless I have something that I, something exciting has happened. Um, I'll be sending out a newsletter next week, actually. Um, talking about my new website, which is that website. You can find me at Exploring Exposure for my workshops, um, some educational materials. My Instagram handle is jennifer.renwick.photography. If you are on Instagram, I do a challenge every Monday called Mud Monday, hashtag Mud Monday. And if you tag images with that, I feature you in my stories on Instagram, anything from a grand landscape to abstract mud. It's been super fun. It's been going on for about two years. You can find me on National Geographic's Your Shot account. I'm a full-time contributor over there, so you'll see me on their feed every now and then. And you can also find me at Jennifer Renwick Nature Photography on Facebook. Um, and I didn't put my email up here, which I should have, um, but it's jennifer at exploringexposure.com. So please feel free to reach out to me. And then you guys are some of the first to see this. I will be having an ebook come out this summer that I've been working tirelessly on for three years, no surprise, on Yellowstone. Um, Yellowstone, Land of Living Art. It's a photography guide to the National Park. <clears throat> David and I have been working on it for such a long time. We're so close to having it done, so look for that sometime hopefully this summer. We're very excited to release it. And with that, I can take questions now. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I do have a question, um, and I okay. put it in the, I just was going to put it in the chat, but I may as well ask it. What do you mean when you said you put the project out with the dolphins into the world? Um, what do you mean? What um, I put that out on my social media feeds, and I did a blog post on my website to share with people. Um, I also, it was one of my first projects. Um, printed in Lenswork magazine. Um, every few issues, they feature some of the Seeing in Sixes projects. They featured it in their magazine. Um, but yeah, I just, after sitting on it a while and taking David's advice, I did put it out there. And 
the response was overwhelming. And in the end, I'm really glad I shared it because I've gotten to talk to people about their own personal stories and what it means to them. Great, um, it looks like there's another question. Jennifer, are you noticing a significant increase in visitors to the national parks in recent oh, years? Oh gosh, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. And yes. Also it's... Has enough visitors to interfere with your enjoyment or access to the parks. Well, I can say yes, <laughs> definitely, but go ahead. Yeah. I think we all have noticed that COVID really struck at a time when our national parks were almost at their limit and then COVID just made it worse. Um, so COVID, people couldn't go to concerts anymore, take their vacations, do kind of their normal things. So everyone flocked into nature, which is fine. I mean, nature is for everyone. And I, you know, it's exciting to see more and pe more people interact with nature, but unfortunately, a lot of those people don't know how to interact with nature. Um, so trash, human waste, graffiti, vandalism just went up tenfold last year. Um, we know a few rangers in quite a few national parks, and I just felt so bad for them last year. And because of COVID, initially people are, you know, afraid of garbage. So I think even the people that usually pick up trash and help out were a little hesitant to just because in the beginning we didn't know how this spread, you know, no one wanted to touch it. But yes, we have seen areas that we have visited for a long time just get totally destroyed because people aren't cognizant that if you walk on that moss it takes a hundred years to grow back. Um, flowers especially. I really hate to stereotype but the Instagrammer like influencers. Anyway, you know they like the California poppies that bloomed I think like one or two years ago they had a super bloom and people just trampled them. I mean, they just walked out to get their selfish image of themselves laying in the poppies without realizing that they were just completely killing them and trampling them. So then other people couldn't enjoy them. Um, today, in fact, there's an area in Moab, Utah with a big panel of petroglyphs, um, a very important panel. It's, I think it's called the birthing panel. So it kind of shows like it depicts, you know, Native American art um, from thousands of years ago. And someone over the weekend defaced it all and wrote white power over it. Um, very disgusting things that I cannot repeat. And the panel is now completely covered and ruined. So it's a big problem. And, you know, that's part of the reason we form nature first. It's not so much to tell people what to do, but just give them a set of principles to kind of keep in mind. And they're not just for photographers. I mean, everyone with a cell phone now is out in nature. So it really, it's anyone going out to enjoy nature. Just be cognizant of where you are. I've stopped sharing locations because it just seems to get people more to these sensitive areas. I've been called an elitist. I've been called a gatekeeper. I will share locations with people that I'm familiar with that I know follow the same practices I do, but it's just, it's not worth it nowadays. And I'm kind of hoping as life goes back to normal, a lot of these people that aren't too familiar with how to behave in nature kind of go back away, but it was a problem even before COVID. And just, you know, leave no trace is super important. Pack it in, pack it out and just simple things like that. So it's not necessarily any of us in this room. I know we all behave better than that, but it, it is very sad. And to touch on your second point, you know, does it interfere with our experience? Kind of. Um, we've learned other places that not a lot of people go that are just as amazing to get that solitude. But for example, Yellowstone, I mean, that's super popular in the summers. So we have found that if you head out in the mornings, like sunrise, there's no one out. You'll have the boardwalk to yourself till 9 or 10 a.m. That's when the steam is the prettiest, um, especially if it's a cold morning. That very painterly light is the best in the morning. And then people tend to come out between 9 and 5. And then as soon as 5 o'clock hits, everyone goes off to dinner and you can have the boardwalk again to yourself from 5 to sunset. So you, you can find ways to enjoy even heavily visited areas by just kind of following the trends of people. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, finding new spots. I think last year taught a lot of us that we have some really cool locations, even not far from our own homes. Um, so David and I have done a lot more exploring around here since we were here all year last year. But yeah, it's, it's a definite problem and it can seem like a complete mountain that you feel like you'll never help, but slowly, 
just by leading by example, encouraging others to do the same, we'll, we'll get there. And it's not as, I mean, it's very negative and it's awful to see, but if we all work together, we can try to, you know, keep these places clean and safe for other generations of photographers to enjoy. Great answer. Anybody else have any questions? Just a, one real quick one. How do you protect your uh, gear when you're you know, on the dunes on a windy day? Yes, that's a very popular question. Um, so I love my camera gear, but I'm also not afraid to put it out in situations. Um, I shoot with Nikon. This is not a plug for Nikon. I mean, any cam, the best camera is the one that you're comfortable shooting with. For me, that's Nikon. It's just what I've always had. And they're very well weather sealed. So I've had my Nikons out in snow, pouring rain, every sandstorm, some of the sandstorms I'm out in, it's 70 mile per hour winds. Um, I've never had one problem. I mean, at all. I don't change lenses when I'm out in those conditions. Obviously I carry around a 28 to 300 with me on my camera. So that gives me quite a range. Um, and I don't even use a UV filter. The sand blowing is really kind of when you're out there, even though it looks like it's all in the atmosphere. I mean, that's where it is. If you're on the ridge or the crest of a dune, you'll find that it's really blowing from like knee down. Um, so if you're on a tripod and you're just careful not to walk below that line, um, otherwise you're gonna get free exfoliation on your face. I've never had a problem with my equipment. I've even, my camera has even face dove into the sand. Um, it was, my zoom lens was a little crunchy for a few days, but it worked itself out. I know that would make a lot of people cringe, but it, it really worked out and it's still fine. Um, so knock on wood and David shoots with Fuji and he's never had a problem. Um, yeah, good to know, thanks. Yeah, as long as you're smart about it, most yeah. cameras will do just fine. It's more the mentality of, oh my gosh, I'm going to take this out there. Like, am I crazy? I think you have to be a little crazy to go out there, but they make the best photos. And we also, I have contacts, so I go out in ski goggles and I do wear a mask. Um, we were wearing N95s out in the dunes four years ago before they were popular, um, just because I have asthma and it's not good to breathe some of that in sometimes. So we look ridiculous when we're out there, but it's, it's fun photography. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see Phil asked if I photograph for any particular company and nope, I just photograph for me. That's pretty easy. Any other questions? No, I wish to thank you for your photographs. We've been uh, traveling all over Ohio since then by ourselves doing covered bridges. And, oh, yeah. And you get out into Ohio in the back country there. It's just nothing but old barns and decay. And it's really, it's really interesting. We've been oh, having yeah, a great those... time. We just oh, gave a presentation. Excellent. We just gave a presentation today on our barns and that and uh, cover bridges. Cover bridges. Um, and a photography oh, yeah. here in West Yeah, a lot of, just a lot of history there. And the graffiti, oh, the graffiti is terrible. Uh, I don't yeah. know how you stop uh, yeah. uh, ridiculous people. I mean, yeah. I think everybody should uh, get back to work so they don't have to they don't have time to tear yes. everything up. <laughs> that's that's how we feel too. It's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. But yeah, I, um, when I lived in Illinois, I know a lot of, I had a lot of friends that would head up to Wisconsin to do those covered bridges. They're ah, very we're, beautiful. We're yeah, going to Wisconsin. Very interesting subjects. We're leaving for Wisconsin Sunday. Uh, the second, we're going up to Wisconsin. Yeah. Anybody else? Come, uh, Hopefully, presentation. I know it's a lot of material. <laughs> oh, it was a great presentation, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Donna? Winter? I just, I just so thoroughly enjoyed um, your entire presentation. Just the whole idea of it, but also your beautiful photography. But, um, you know, just reminding 
to. Oh, I can't hear you, Donna. I think you're talking. I don't know why I can't am hear I... you. Is I it can hear you now. I might have backed. Oh, off. there we go. Now I can hear you. <laughs> I might have sat back a little bit, and um, but anyway, just just your spectacular photography, but also the entire message um, of of what you brought across. So thank you so much. It was really a wonderful presentation. I was enthralled from the very beginning. So. Oh well, thank you guys. Thank you all for listening and. Yeah, I, I just, I love talking about this subject and hopefully I gave you guys some ideas to head out into the field with just to challenge yourself to try something new for sure. Mm -hmm. But thank you for having me. I really appreciate Very it. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Good night. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very welcome. Much. Thank you guys. Good night, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Right. See you in December. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that Bye was anyone. wonderful. Bye everyone. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks, right. guys. Take care. See you soon. Good night, everyone. Good night.